Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 628. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today's November 3rd, 2020. It's the feast day on our church calendar of Martin de Pools, and it's election day in the United States of America. All right, welcome to another program. Uh, people are wondering where I'm in. I, where I'm in, I can't even speak. Uh, the RV is parked at Jonathan Dixon State Park in Jupiter, Florida. We've uh, uh, arrived here again on this coast, and today is, like you said, George, sometimes it gets cold in Florida. It's 75, and I saw people walking by the RV with uh, warm jackets. Nobody has gloves on yet. That must be 70. But, I've got my suit coat on because I'm so cold. <laughs> and I'm out there, and I'm going to go for my bike right after the show. I'm like, maybe I should just throw a jacket on just to, to show I'm one of you guys. That I, that, that I'm, I'm a Flor- I I'm want to be a Floridian, too. At least I want to fit in. So, Oh, uh, Kevin, you're, you're on Jupiter Island. If you're going to be one of those guys, I think your RV is going to have to get a lot bigger. Oh That's, oh, the you homes know, maybe are huge. Maybe, maybe, Maybe uh, Tiger Woods or Jack Nicholas will let you park in their drive or park in their service entrance. That's right. That's what you were telling me about. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I went for my bike ride the other day down the, the main drag of Jupiter Island, and uh, there are some nice homes, nice cars, and uh, lots of police vehicles. So obviously there's a high tax rate that you can afford such a mighty police force for such a small town. And... I'm driving by these mansions, and they have the, the little loopy driveways and stuff like that. And after the loopy driveway, it says, service entrance. What? Sir, I'm different. So there's money down here, George. None of it's mine. Uh, but a good tax base for Jupiter Island. Uh, before we get too far down to the news, uh, if you have invested in Valium shares or anxiety pills, uh, this is it. This is where you're getting your payoff. It's an election day here in America. It uh, happens once every four years. It's part of being in a uh, democratic republic that we have uh, democratic, a democracy, a where we are represented. And a republic. People, what's going on here? I just have had all my coffee. Hold on. French press. Ooh, can't beat that. We are part of a republic supported by a democracy and one of the cool things is every four years we get to choose our leaders and one of the really bad things about choosing our leaders is we have now social media telling us how to to vote and if we vote for the wrong guy it's all over and right now tomorrow probably next week sometime we will learn the winner and half of this country is going to be very unhappy george my wife Susan has out been out in Seattle for the past two weeks. Mm-hmm. That's why she didn't join Kevin and I at dinner on uh, Friday night. And the, our daughter Claudia had a bicycle accident, and she suff- and Claudia is suffering from uh, post concussion syndrome, and is on medical leave. And our daughter, my wife, is taking care of Claudia, and she'll probably be there for the rest of the month. Well, Claudia lives in the Capitol Hill area of Seattle which some of you may remember Chop or Chaz. Chaz. Claudia lives in the middle of that place. And the police in Seattle have already closed down the streets in Claudia's neighborhood. And the merchants and the coffee shops and the antique boutiques and the aromatherapy candle stores have all boarded up because they're fearful that there's going to be violence, uh, whichever way the election goes. If Trump wins, there'll be violence. If Biden wins, There'll be violence. It'll be the same people causing the yeah. same violence. But we've got in our class of uh, person uh, who just revels in the street theater and violence and fires and looting and all yeah, that I mean, stuff. The, the Antifa, the, uh, there's just a thuggery that goes around now uh, where the other side of me, anyway, are bullies. Uh, if you don't believe the way we believe we're going to be bullies, we're going to be cancel your, try to cancel your life, get you fired. Um, how dare you don't believe the way we believe? And it's, it's thuggery now. Well, it, here's a funny thing. Um, Claudia uh, 
Kevin, you've driven around Florida, and every other barn has Trump printed on it, or painted on it. Yes, it has. And in some of the retirement communities, you'll see a few Biden signs, but you'll see a lot of political signs around here. Uh, Susan reports that walking around the neighborhood because she can't drive, she's not seen a single Trump sign, but she's maybe only seen one or two Biden signs. Right. And what it's telling Susan and her thinking is, is that people are not so much pro-Biden as they're anti-Trump in that super liberal enclave of uh, Seattle. So I wonder if that's a hint, uh, whether people are more animated, if people who are more animated by being against something will vote rather than people who are animated for something. Uh, yeah, I mean, are you, is this election against something or for something? Uh, there is a lot of Trump hate in this world. Uh, nobody is moderate on Trump. Nobody says, I don't care who wins. You either love who is the president right now or you hate him. And when we were in Madison a couple months ago, I remember the distinct lack of Biden signs. Madison, Wisconsin is, you know, a socialist paradise. Uh, it's supported by the University of Wisconsin, by the state capitals downtown there. And in all my bike rides, I probably saw a total of six Biden signs. If the, when the, Hillary was running for president, it was all Hillary. Every sign was a Hillary sign. And so you're like, you know, Biden doesn't have the support. He, they're not voting for Biden. They're voting against Trump. And we'll see if that works. I don't know. But, you know, Kevin, God loves drunks, fools in the United States of America. It's, Whatever happens, we're going to be fine. Absolutely. We'll have a week. We'll have a week of, uh, well, I, I asked Susan to go to the ATM, get as much cash out as she could fill the car with gas and be ready in a moment's notice to drive to her other daughters in California. Sure. So maybe it's safer in San Francisco versus Seattle. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, scripture tells us to be anxious in nothing, and that applies to U.S. elections. Um, now, the people who want you to vote want you to do this anxiously. They want you to support their candidate. They want you to come out and to be sure you come out and you you have a right to vote and you have a right not to vote as well but um if you find somebody that you uh support their policies go for it i you know that that's part of the american tradition uh america is the longest running free democracy in the world it will be uh centuries from now uh it's a uh, a smart vibrant capitalist country uh can we accidentally overturned the Constitution. Yeah, you need to be careful. Yeah, be wise. Uh, we now have a conservative Supreme Court, but you're going to be very surprised by uh, some of their decisions in the future aren't as conservative as you thought they were going to be. It's just the way it works. You know, Ronald Reagan and George Bush uh, H. will tell you that <laughs> not every uh, nominated justice turns out the way they wanted it to. But uh, that that's just... that's. That's a reality. George, let's move on to the news beyond the election. Uh, please go vote. We, we, we want you to vote. Um, beyond the election, there's lots of news out there. England has uh, shut down again. Uh, the Isles of the British Isles uh, are in lockdown. Uh, France has gone into lockdown again. Uh, the churches are closed until sometime in December. I'm not hearing protest. I heard that the Roman Catholics are well, speaking, but there's not a lot of them in in England. So, yeah. Yes, I'm I'm not going to the French West Indies this year. Usually, <laughs> I take a month uh, yeah. to go to St. Bart's, which is sort of like Jupiter Island, but with French restaurants uh, oh, in the Caribbean. Cool. Yeah, uh, because France has shut down uh, entry into the islands, into their territories. Um, but on Saturday at 5 p.m. Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced that be, that he will he is proposing a lockdown of Britain. Um, there's a whole long list of things you can do and you can't do. He encourages people to go to work. The courts and the schools and the universities will be open, but you're not allowed to visit people socially. Uh, restaurants can only do uh, takeout. They can't eat inside. Pubs are closed. And for our purposes, churches, you may enter a church for private worship, and you may have a funeral of that has less than 30 people attending, not dying. Um, but public worship 
in England has been essentially banned until uh, beginning of December when the government will reassess this. Now, that night, the Catholic Church put out, the uh, Catholic Church of England and Wales put out a strong statement saying, we understand that there's new wave of COVID and it's bad, but government, British government, you have not demonstrated to us that your policies will do anything other than destroy the economy and destroy social, uh, our social lives, including our social intercourse with people, including worship. You need to be able to prove that the steps that you're taking are not just knee-jerk reactions. The British, uh, the Church of England, the same night, the Bishop of London put out a, well, we'll study this list, letter. And then uh, I think the next day, she and the Archbishops of Canterbury and York put out a quite mealy-mouthed letter of uh, moaning and groaning, oh, isn't this terrible? Oh, we're so sad, but we should obey the government because they know better. Now, other British groups, uh, for the Society for Word and Faith, uh, some conservative groups within the Church of England said, oh, this is terrible, yet the government has to show why we need to do this. But the National Church of England, once again, is supine. Uh, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render under Caesar the things that are God, is now the uh, motto that we're seeing from this uh, House of Bishops. Well, I mean, if you go back far enough, the Black Plague wiped out much of Europe. Uh, the estimates say half the population. But that can't be in the collective memory of modern church. That can't be in the collective memory of the modern government uh, of European countries. What they're reacting to is they're trying to stop another wave and their only answer is to stop people from gathering. But I don't think closing the churches is the way they want to do it. I am very disappointed in the lack of protests from the churches at this point. I have mixed emotions on this. I have my personal view on uh, masks and things of that nature, but I'm not a scientist. And frankly, I no longer believe in experts yeah. because we've had experts weigh in on both sides and we've had the uh, science being used to pander and prop up political agendas, both on the left and the right. Mm -hmm. We have the same group of scientists in the United States who say, oh, you cannot go outside without a mask. You cannot, you know, 700 people have died from COVID who attended Donald Trump rallies. Therefore, Trump should not have had rallies. Those same exact people say it's perfectly fine for Black Lives Matter and Antifa people to gather in the streets and protest without masks. Um, science as an institution uh, is lost a, a tremendous amount of credibility in my mind. That being said, I have to work with the people as they are. Yeah. And I am not going to buy my, I can only demonstrate what I believe by my actions and my compassion. So we've reopened the church and I've got four in-person services where everybody's spread out, two of them are outside. Uh, but I, at the same time, am continuing the online services and reaching out to people because I cannot tell that little old lady or that couple uh, or that uh, family who are raising the grandchild, uh, you need to come to church uh, because, but they're because, but they've received uh, media information telling them that, that it's a death sentence to step outside. Yeah, it's, this is the most surreal year in, in a long time. But uh, we have survived worse uh, than COVID. We've survived worse than an election between Biden and Trump. We've survived uh, much worse. Um, this, this past weekend, uh, sat, Halloween was Saturday night, um, and Halloween was essentially canceled. Huh. And so what I did on Saturday morning, I went to Sam's Club Friday, and I bought several truckloads of candies, and I packed up uh, a two dozen or so little trick-or-treat bags Meanwhile, eating 20 Tootsie Rolls yes, myself. Say, how many arrived? <laughs> and I went from house to house to each of our children's house in the Sunday school with a trick-or-treat bag. And it was as 
it was as if I was Santa Claus sure, or Candy Santa. Because these poor children, their lives. I know it's, it's Halloween is not the most important thing, but they are not being socialized. They're yeah. stuck at home with video school, and half of the kids are not, you know, they're playing video games while they should be doing their video schooling. Um, because not every parent is at home, or not every parent has the ability to monitor their children. Mm -hmm. But the social, le what? is happening to this youngest generation who's losing a year of their education what's happening to the socialization of people of high school football the things that sort of speak to what america is about going to church um and now i wouldn't claim that going to church and high school football are central activities the way high school football is but, yeah, yeah i was gonna say what are you saying here <laughs> but but it I, I just don't think that we've had a wise, uh, wise management of this crisis. We've been put in a situation that we have no control over, um, a visceral control over. Nobody knew how bad COVID would be. Um, nobody knew how easy it was spread. It's clearly a highly contagious disease. Uh, it clearly has severe symptoms for a small portion of society. Uh, it clearly overwhelms uh, the hospitals where there's breakouts in, in those, uh, the towns where there's breakouts. Um, clearly, people end up on ventilators, and of them, a portion die. It's you know, it's just one of those. Wow, where did this? You know, we still haven't gotten our mind around it yet on COVID. Maybe it's because I'm an American or whatever, mm -hmm. but I see two issues here. One is the wearing of masks for health purposes. Mm -hmm. That I'm that I can hear, I understand, and I'll do it. The other is being told I have to, and that's right. an issue of personal freedom. Hmm. I don't like to be told what to do, and if you're impinging upon my personal freedom, I'm stubborn enough to just not do it. But if it's, you know, do this for these health purposes and help your fellow man, I'm happy. So this, maybe it's because I'm screwy, but I need to find my own balance here. <laughs> And government governments that come down totally heavy-handed and squelch personal autonomy and freedom, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the United States. Kevin, one of the things, uh, we you, you posted the picture of us out and some people wrote, where were your masks? And uh, I wrote, well, this is Florida. Nobody's yeah, wearing a mask. mask. Yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> what have you, Kevin, what, <laughs> am I exaggerating about my experiences here in Hooterville? What are you experiencing? No, no, we, you and I went out for dinner the other night. Uh, my wife joined us, and uh, we went to a restaurant, and Jill and I have been faithfully wearing masks when outside in an enclosed public area, a restaurant, a gas station, a museum, a national park, uh, you know, visitor center. We wear a mask. We walk into this, you know, Cedar River, whatever restaurant in, in the middle of Hooterville, Florida. No mask. They're wiping down the menus. <laughs> I saw that they had little disinfectant for the menus, but the customers and the waiters and the cooks, there's no mask. And I think in Hooterville, it's very unlikely to ever reach there. I don't think COVID is is hightailing itself for Hooterville and spreading. If it did, I think these these are the wonderful type of people who, if they saw a danger, and somebody did get sick, they would put a mask on. But they just don't see it. They don't. I. I. I what COVID? Well, I think the hostess thought Jill was bringing her own doggy bag. Yes, uh, not knowing what the mask was for. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So we it's down. Uh, but oh, no you know, mask, I, mask. No mask. Kevin so. and I jokingly call that part of the world I live in Hooterville, which mm -hmm. for non-Americans is a reference to an old 60s television show, mm -hmm. uh, Green Acres, uh, which was Hooterville was the uh, rural hamlet in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. and that's where I live. Uh, <laughs> no, and so um, I don't want to spend all our time on, uh, on these topics because uh, we have breaking news this week about uh, Bishop Jim Hobby uh, resigning as... Bishop of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and uh, it was a surprise. And people said, "What? Wait a minute! What happened?" It did, you know, usually bishops only resign when there's you know going on, and they got caught. 
And so that was the the initial su- assumptions. We put out our field leaders and said, no, it's not that. Uh, I, you know, Jim Hobby was faced with a tough decision and uh, made the wrong call over time. And in consultation with the standing committee, uh, decided to resign. He could have fought it. And that uh, we take a little bit of time here uh, George, to talk about the details, because I'm a fan of Jim Hobby. He's a great person, uh, a wonderful pastor and priest. And um, this is not nefarious. This is kind of the sin of omission, not commission. I think this was a system working perfectly. Yeah. And I think it's a man of integrity and decency. And that's yeah. Jim Hobby. Yeah. It's a tragedy. This is a tragedy, a true tragedy. Um, it has nothing, anything like the Roman Catholic Church cover-ups of sexual abuse or some of the acne scandals of uh, people doing immoral things. Nothing at all like that. Acne scandal or you mean tech scandal? Well, I'm thinking of the Tallahassee uh, Cathedral oh, yeah, 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 Demon. Yeah, 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 yeah. uh, well, that wasn't cover-up when they found out. They, I mean, it, when you look no, back, the, the, this is... This is a feather in the cap of the ACNA. This was this is another situation where a bishop is being held accountable. Yeah, and but it's just a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, okay, there was a, a pu- priest in the diocese of Pittsburgh accused of uh, misconduct and abuse. I don't know the details. And Bishop Hobby in- intervened and investigated and. The standing committee felt that he took almost a year to do something and they didn't feel that he acted expeditiously. They didn't believe that he followed all the canonical regulations in, you know, suspension and this and that. Bishop Hobby seems to have taken a pastoral approach to this issue rather than a stricter uh, check off the boxes approach. The standing committee basically said, we don't have confidence in your leadership uh, Bishop Hoppy, because of how you've handled this crisis. It wasn't covered up. It wasn't ignored. It was just not handled expeditiously, or it was handled with a priority of the pastoral over the canonical. That is my understanding. That I'm sure people We could be wrong. Different... I mean, if, if you want to correct and, us, correct us. And so the standing committee reached out and spoke with... Uh, Archbishop Foley Beach and uh, and Beach's advisors and they followed the canonical process and asked Bishop Hobby to step down. Bishop Hobby could have asked for a trial uh, to clear his name, a trial before the House of Bishops to show that he had not engaged and for them to decide had he acted properly or improperly. Bishop Hobby decided to spare the diocese the expense and the embarrassment of a trial and because the he had no longer the confidence of the standing committee he resigned this is a tragedy i hope the acna is able to find another place for this outstanding minister and pastor he just didn't handle one of the jobs required of a bishop and this is why i'm saying this is completely different from a bishop covering up or lord or a bishop doing something bad, he did not engage in moral turpitude. He did not try to uh, smooth things over to not create waves. It looks like to me he decided to be pastoral uh, and made a mistake in not exercising enough discipline. We need to let our viewers know that being a bishop is impossibly difficult, even in the best of times. You're dealing with personalities, with uh, situations that arise all the time and uh, sometimes you're making calls uh, on the ground uh, without consulting the playbook and sometimes that comes back to to bite you and this may be that case we don't know the full story here Um, but I I do know that uh, I I don't fault the ACNA I don't fault the diocese for doing this and I don't fault Jim for uh, stepping down and saying it's not worth fighting for uh, I'm not going to fight the charges and I can serve better in a different way some other day yeah. some of the backstory just from the news side backstory mm-hmm. um, 
we got a, a a heads up that something major was coming last week. Um, we weren't told what exactly it was. When it hit, we were both surprised. Mm -hmm. We ran with it. And I immediately contacted the Diocese of Pittsburgh with questions because essentially I said, you know, I can't really tell is, has Bishop Hoppy done something immoral? Has Bishop Hoppy done something that is incompetent? Or in other words, what exactly is this? And they said, we need some time for the standing committee to write this out that is fair and honest, but at the same time doesn't hang out any victim to dry. Mm -hmm. Now, and I said, it's fine. You know, it's better for you. In my mind, my thinking, it's better for them to do it right the first time than to just do it to do it. Now, of course, people then immediately began to speculate and assuming evil thoughts and evil motives. And perhaps life uh, has led them to assume the worst. But when they finally did come out with their statement, I basically had also been checking, and I'm confident that what they say is true. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel called upon to write a world intergalactic planetary exclusive to make sure I was a half hour ahead of everybody else. It's better to have the truth out. Um, they seen I handled this right. Mm -hmm. They did really it right. From a communications perspective, from a moral perspective, it's just a tragedy. And it, and but, but the system's working now, George. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons we have these in the canons, what you should do when you come across the situation, is because in the past, bishops haven't handled it right. It's a tough call. What do I do? You know, what do I do now? Well, you, you can turn to the handbook. ACNA has a nice handbook on what to do when this happens. Um, but for the last 2,000 years, bishops have come across those situations and done the wrong thing. Well, I'll take them out of ministry and I'll go put them in children's education. No, 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 don't do that. You know, it's just, you know, in the past, the wrong has been done. We have on paper now what to do when, when this situation arises. Please consult the handbook because we know being a bishop is hard. But Kevin, sometimes not everything's in the handbook. No, we I, have yeah, this I story out of England uh, that uh, I don't think this has quite been covered before. Okay. The issue that is affecting the Bishop of Burnley. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> to bring our readers and viewers up to speed, um, PETA, the, uh, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, has come down hard on the Bishop of Burley, Burnley because uh, he opposes having cat service, uh, cat death, f cat funerals? Was it a cat funeral or a, a celebration of life? Service of, a celebration of life and service of thanksgiving held by uh, the Dean of Southern Cathedral for Dorkins the Magnificat, the but church yeah. cat who died. Do we celebrate all nine of the lives or just one? Are there nine services? I just like, <laughs> I read the story. You have to go to Anglican.ing to, to read this. So Pete is all mad at a bishop because he's mad at the dean for having a, a service for a cat. Um, I'm not into using church space for uh, funerals for cats. I, I'm with the bishop on this. You have blessing of animals in your church. And we have a little pet memorial garden where people mm -hmm. can bring their ashes. And if you don't want to pay the full freight for the graveyard, we can put grandma in the cat cemetery for nothing. No, that's a joke. Um, well, here's the story. Uh, about 10, 12 years ago, the Southern Cathedral on the south side of, on the Surrey side of, in of London, um, we had a stray cat that sort of set up shop there and became a pet and was a mouser and would sleep in the uh, chancel of the church and everything. It was just a lot of churches have cats like that. And in cities, you you like to have them around because they keep the rodent population down. Well, Southern Cathedral was clever. They marketed this cat uh, you could buy. And the dean and Colin Slee, the former dean, named it Dorkins the Magnificat after Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist. 
And Southern Cathedral's gift shops sold little coasters and postcards and of the Magnificat. And the cat even had a Twitter account with 6,000 followers. What? Well, the cat, yes. The cat finally died. I don't know if it had a blue check on it, though, but nonetheless. Uh, the cat died in September, and they had a little memorial service out at the cathedral before interring the ashes in the churchyard. And the cathedral sort of played this up as a media event. You know, a local interest story for a secular society that is very mawkish about animals. So I can understand entirely where the cathedral's coming from. Well, the Anglo-Catholic Bishop of Burnley, Philip North, uh, acted as a good, cranky Anglo-Catholic bishop should. <laughs> a deviation from the Book of Common Prayer saying, I hope you people are not serious because this is offensive to people who we really are burying who are dying of COVID. You're going all out for a cat and I've got old people stacked up like cordwood dying of COVID up here in the north of England. Okay. And, you know, that was sort of fun to see a little cranky spat, you know. But then PETA came in, and PETA has demanded from the Archbishop of Canterbury that they he fire Philip North. Now, technically, North is in the province of York, so yeah, they see the trail yeah. should fire him. So, <laughs> so, so here, here's a wonderful out for Justin Welby if he doesn't want to offend anybody. Say, oh, well, I need to move this from my inbox and send it up to New York to have it in their inbox. Peter said the bishop is gu guilty of speciesism, preferring humans over all other creatures, and that four-legged members of the Church of England should be given the same consideration as two-legged members of the Church of England and treated the same. Here's a heresy test for you. And this is a quote from the story. Uh, this is, I think it's from, uh, the Peter said this? I don't know. The central tenet of Christianity is kindness towards all of God's creatures, including those who have fur, feathers, or fins. If the bishop doesn't understand this, we ask that he resign from a post that he's not fit to hold. Now, there may be people in England who have furs, feathers, and fins. Yes. Um, <laughs> And they may have four legs, not two legs. Mm. But this is just so wonderfully awful uh, because I think PETA is just enjoying themselves, getting their they're getting their names in the papers by being over the top and silly. Um, this is a wonderfully it is a fun story. This, yeah. this story should have come out in August when nothing else is happening, mm -hmm. uh, but. Now we can be very somber and say this speaks to a total misunderstanding of Christian anthropology. Uh, that, uh, and then we'll have the Thomists uh, tell us that, uh, well, of course, animals do not have souls. the sort of souls that uh, we have. And then the followers of uh, C.S. Lewis and John Bunyan will respond about why there are animals in heaven and we'll have a dissertation Ex, uh, on Paul's understanding that all creation groans in anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ, meaning that the souls of animals are anticipating the coming of Christ, where they will be free, free. from the sins. I'm now, waiting we for. Can go into all that. Hmm? I'm waiting for a press release from the Druids, but go on. We can go into all that, but. Hmm? Uh, uh, I think I'll, my personal stance is uh, sort of follows that of Billy Graham. Billy Graham was asked, will I see my dog in heaven? And Billy Graham says, heaven is a place of all love and joy and peace. And if you need to see your dog in heaven to experience that love, you will see your dog in heaven. Very pragmatic. He's not a Thomist. Hmm. Uh, but uh, I'm happy with that answer. Yeah, I could see dogs, but... Not cats, George. You're right. No, you, yeah, not uh, cats. Not well, cats. I, I think I think yeah. you're right, Kevin. Uh, dogs in heaven, not cats. Yeah. I, I've had many cats. Not <laughs> they have this attitude, like if heaven exists, I don't want to go there. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever. All right, been a fun show. Uh, please, people, don't be anxious in anything. We know it's uh, 
a hard time. George, you alluded to that we went to a restaurant. Uh, we're going out to eat for Thanksgiving uh, somewhere in Orlando. Uh, we'll uh, meet you up there somewhere. Bring the other webcam. If you can't tell, George has a new webcam. Uh, do, do people know how hard it is to install a webcam, George? Well, if they're me, they do. <laughs> yes. Kevin uh, ships the webcams to me because I have a multiple single address yes. about where he has a different address each week. And I installed it this morning, and we we warm up the computers, and we communicate with each other, and I say, okay, Kevin, I'm going to switch over to the new camera, and I get a gray screen. And I switch back, and I get, and I we can see each other. I switch forward. The little green light's on. Mm -hmm. Everything's working. And Kevin says, well, why don't you read the instructions online? And I read the instructions, and I go through all, the, yeah, I've done all this stuff. And then I look at the various parts of this camera at the back page. And I figure out if I take the lens cap off, perhaps Kevin can see me. <laughs> it's a strange world. Yeah, uh, they didn't used to sell um, webcams with uh, security features, but you know now that people can hack webcams, hack cell phones, hack microphones, um, it's such a hackable world. I hope they can't hack elections. Oh, that's a different topic. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Kong, and you've been watching episode 628 of Anglican Unscripted.